and we are live. Welcome, mystery and thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am so excited to welcome to the show tonight private investigator, true crime aficionado, and author, Jay Ruben Appleman, who's here to give us the inside scoop on his brand new book, While Idaho Slept, about the case that consumed us all last November. Jay, welcome to Mystery and Thriller Mavens. Tell us about this book. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting. I think you said you're a true crime aficionado. I, I have not been a true crime, uh, or you said I'm a true crime aficionado. I am not really a fan of true crime, to be honest. Um, I I It's too dark for me to consume on a daily basis. Um, but I, but I write about things that I care about and they happen to be in the true crime genre. Uh, my first book, the kill jar, which you asked me about off air, uh, so to speak, um, was, uh, about four murders that occurred in the, in the environs of where I grew up. And, and that case mattered a lot to me. It haunted me as a child and I grew up, uh, obsessed with it and wanting to figure out, um, what happened with that case? It, it had officially been cold, so to speak, or um, or un unofficially they kept it open, but it was basically a cold case. Um, and and I wrote about that because it mattered to me. Uh, it happened in my hood, and and it happened to people, you know, so more or less my community and who I people I cared about, and um, and that's the same thing that happened now with you know five years later, my next book, as you say, uh, while Idaho slept, uh, I didn't set out to write. Uh, about the case because it, it it had because it was popular or because I'm a person who chases after the next uh, case du jour or whatever. Um, I, I wrote about it because it happened basically in my community. You know, Idaho is a really small place. Uh, it, you know, it's five hours. Moscow, where it happened, is five hours away from where I'm based in Boise. But there are so many tentacles uh, between our communities. Boise is tied in so many ways to to the community of Moscow. Uh, I, I know dozens of people whose children go to the University of Idaho, where these students went. My own, one of my own children went to the University of Idaho. Um, I've worked, I've worked up there in Moscow as a private investigator on a number of cases. Um, you know, and it's just, it's just a place that uh, people go to vacation to North Idaho. It's, 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 it's no different than um, uh, than most communities. Even though it's a, the state is very long, it takes you a long time to get to the top. Uh, it, it's, it feels like it's your, it's your own community when it happens so close. And, and I went, I went up there not intending to write a book, not intending to be one of the many people covering this case. I just went up there because, uh, I felt compelled. My heart, my heart hurt for what was going on. Just like, you know, at the end of your block, when an ambulance shows up, you want to know who's, who's in pain, who's in trouble, who are they taking away in that ambulance? Um, and, and that's kind of, what drove me to North Idaho at the time of these murders or right after these murders. And so I ended up writing a book about the case, but a lot of people will ask like, well, uh, how are you, how did you write this? I know it's going to be your next question. How did you write this book um, before a trial occurs um, for in the, in, for the perpetrator, for the alleged perpetrator? Uh, my my uh, motivation writing the book was not to figure out um, or not to get to the, uh, uh, not to provide a conclusion to a trial. That has nothing to do with it for me. For me, it's about how communities uh, recover from the visitation of this type of violence in their lives, how people, uh, the the, fam the surviving family members of the victims so, uh, or or the surviving uh, victims, actually, uh, the two that the two girls that survived, you know, how do these people repair their lives and find hope? Uh, what does this say about our society that there's millions and millions of eyeballs on this case? Um, things like that. And so I wrote about societally what's happening with the true crime movement, how the media frenzy affected the movement in this case, um, and things like things like that. Well, it addresses so many important, um, you know, topics and themes and um, and certainly, you know, you're raising so many, a few of them right now, um, because we need to talk about that. Um, you know, what it, what are these effects and how does it impact us? And I thought that that was really great that you addressed that in your book. And it wasn't just about this crime, although this crime is fascinating and, and, and held so many of us for that you know, nearly two months while they were looking for him. Um, you know, I just remember watching it constantly um, because I think, you know, it taps into so many of our deepest fears of this idea of, you know, being asleep in the safety of your home and the safety of your bed in the privacy of your bedroom and not, but not being safe there. And that fundamental, you know, 
breach of, of security and safety is, is everybody's worst nightmare. So I can't wait to talk to you about that as well. Um, first, I just want to welcome everyone. We are broadcasting live to seven different destinations across Facebook and YouTube. So mystery and thriller loving friends, no matter where you're watching from, you're in the right place. This is the right time. It is mystery Monday. And because Mondays can be murder, we're going to make them a little less painful for you. So if you've been here before, you know the drill. And if you're new, welcome friends. We're so happy to have you. Here's the drill. Every Monday, I give you my handpicked featured authors and you get to ask them anything. So ask Jay about his writing process, about his investigation process, about, you know, his, his, cre his relationship to creativity, his, his, his practice of craft, anything you want. What happens in Mystery and Thriller Ravens stays on Mystery and Thriller Ravens, just like Vegas, but more murdery. So um, go ahead and get those questions going in the comments. Leecha, welcome to the conversation saying, hi, Sarah and Jay Rubin. Welcome. Hi, Leecha. So great to have you. Um, so Leecha is wondering who, what, who or what was the hardest to write about this and why was that? Well, honestly, the hardest, I think you said who was the hardest character, who has been the hardest character is what the comment says question says, and, and I, it, it, they were all so hard. Um, it was very difficult to, for starters, approach the family members of these victims in the midst of their mourning. That was a really difficult thing to do. Uh, and, and so it made each of the characters, as you're calling them, but the, I understand why, but the victims uh, basically um, equally difficult. You know, you, you're, you're, you're reaching out to these people really recently after the loss of, in, in a horrific fashion, the loss of, of the, the, their, their closest to their heart, their children. Uh, I cannot imagine what they, they were going through. I cannot imagine what they continue to go through. Um, but part of the job of a writer of this kind of material is, is to give them an opportunity, give those surviving family members an opportunity to speak to you if they want to. The worst scenario would be to not reach out to them. A book comes out and they say, why the hell didn't you call me? Um, and, and so you have to do that due diligence and reach out to them and it makes it really difficult. You also want to tell the right story. You don't want to, you don't want to be wrong in the, in the people that are, cl are closest to that story are the surviving family members of the victims. And so that's another reason you have to reach out to them. And, but every time I did, I would call, I would text, I would DM them through social media. Um, I sent them emails. It was really difficult. And, um, and I think that's the answer, you know, the, 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 the fun part of the story, tell, telling the story, I could say if there was anything, was, was um, chronicling the, what I saw as the, the, the good work of the police department, um, in this case, uh, the multiple mm. police departments. Uh, that, and that was actually not difficult, but enjoyable because that part, because if you're looking at it from, as just a story, um, you know, the chief of police up there uh, and, his, and his immediate reports were just ama were amazing to chronicle. So when you were, let's go back to the hardest part for just a second. And then I want to talk more about the fun part. So what do you think is, you know, made them want to trust you? Was it the fact that you had written a book before? Was it that you were a member of the Idaho community five short hours away? Is it that you, you know, your, your children have gone there. They feel like, Hey, this is a person who's known to us. Or is it that you, you know, that you establish credibility? Like what made them, how did you do that? Uh, partially all of those things that you just said. Uh, uh, one, the major reason that Harper Collins, who is the publisher of the book, uh, pegged me to write the book is because I'm, I've been in Idaho for nearly 25 years. Uh, my first book uh, was a, was took place in Detroit. It was about a cold case in Detroit, but I had been in Detroit for 25 years as well. You know, there's something about being about being a part of that community that you're writing about. That it's not that it gives it authenticity. It's that it's the only way to have authenticity. Um, it is to be, a, it's to be like, you know, there were a lot of people dropping in from the East coast, parachuting in, so to speak, and wanting to, wanting to tell that story, but they don't know anything about Idaho. They certainly don't anything about North Idaho. Um, they don't, and, and that's nothing about East coast reporters. The fact is uh, some of the brightest minds in the world live on the East coast. Right. But when you're dropped into a little mountain village uh, you're not expected to fit in. There's no way you could immediately. Um, and so, and so, um, yeah, I, I blended in, so to speak. Um, I, I, but I also look. I, I am. I've, I've been a federally vetted private investigator for ten years. I've worked in multiple states on major fraud cases. 
Um, I was a professor uh, in, uh, at Boise State University, at Idaho State University. I uh, taught courses on, I've taught courses on human trafficking uh, for the Honors College at Boise State. I've uh, carried myself with dignity and, and an ethical code in my writing for decades now. So there's a lot of that. And it's, and it really was, and I'm not, I'm not, um, I think, I think one of the most important things we have is, is uh, breaking news journalists, one of the important groups of people, breaking news journalists or podcasters or YouTubers. Um, you, you give information when we need it right away. Uh, what a, what a book does is it allows extra time and space to absorb all the, all the headline news that we've gotten from from the online community, it gives a place that it, it, it gives context to it all, and it and it and it gives uh, the proper space and respect for people to be able to breathe through it and understand it. And I think mm. that was, a, and I think that was apparent in the way I approached asking the questions. I I made it very clear. Look, I'm not here with you know the thing you say to me right now is not going live in five seconds, right? It's 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 just talk to me. I'm a person, and and people talk to me because of that. And, and I think it's, you know, I've never betrayed that confidence that people have given me. I've never betrayed the confidentiality uh, that people request. When people say, mm -hmm. I don't want to be named, I don't name them. When somebody mm -hmm. said to me, oh, stop calling me, I stopped calling them. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not on a corporate uh, bankroll. I'm not reporting live on Fox tonight, you know, so I, so I have the ability to step back and reconfigure my plans, right? So mm. they trusted that a little bit more. And I, but I, I understand the the pressures of breaking news reporters, and 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 that's the most important job. Like, if it weren't for breaking news reporters, we wouldn't know what's going on in the Middle East. But right now, we wouldn't know what's. Oh God. I mean, all of these things need somebody to tell their story. But it was apparent to the people that had been overrun by media that I was a different type of person. I think telling mm. this, and that allowed you to 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 right with the depth texture and contextualization that you did i think i think um, so Leecha says thank you very thank you so much for answering my questions she says you have a hard job um Leecha, that's that is true and she says and thank you um randy welcome to the conversation he wants to know did you have any bad experiences reaching out to the families or were or were they very helpful uh the experience were not the experiences were not um, bad in the in the way that you you might be thinking. Um, nobody yelled at me or anything like that, but they were bad. Sometimes they were bad in the sense that uh, that I carried a lot of guilt for having to do it. Um, like when people didn't answer me, part I, I really needed to at least touch base with them and say, "Here's what I'm actually doing. Do you want to talk to me?" Right, and um, and sometimes that took six text messages or four phone calls. And, and then I would catch them off guard one day while they were at the store or something. And I'd say, Hey, it's me again. Um, I've sent you six emails. Um, now I'm talking to you on the phone and you didn't, I, and you didn't expect this, but here I am. And, um, and that's, that's difficult. Um, but in it's, I don't know if it's cultural or what, but, but um, maybe it's because North Idaho is, is the, the people are a certain way. Um, nobody, nobody gave me the F-bomb and, you know, told me or told me to piss off or whatever. Like it, it was, everybody was very polite. Um, everybody was very cordial to me and helpful in that sense. Um, I think people understood that I had, that I was trying to, you know, I was trying to tell the story of their children and, um, and they understood they, if they didn't want to help, uh, they had every right not to, not to, but they didn't take it out on me. Um, mm. So it, they were actually very gracious and, um, and some, and some were helpful. Um, the, the, the problem with this case is, be, is, is that it's ongoing. So there's a gag order in place, right? So I couldn't get certain information from family members in my first, with my first book, the kill jar, uh, I came to that, that, uh, that case 30 years after 30 years or so after it had, it happened. And, um, family members of the victims had already compiled all kinds of documentation, um, in fact, one of the victim's sisters wrote the foreword to my book. Kathy Broad wrote the foreword to the book. She's the sister of Timothy King, the fourth victim in the Oakland County child killer case. And she provided me with thousands of pages of documents. Um, there was all kinds of stuff that could be FOIA'd, you know, Free Freedom of Information Act requests. And, and um, in this case, the current case, because it's ongoing, none of that was available. Um, so even if the families wanted to give me information that they had, 
they, they, they aren't actually allowed to. Um, so uh, that, that made it a little difficult, but no, the, the, the answer that no real bad experiences, everybody was helpful in the sense that they graciously uh, did not take any of their, uh, their anger or emotions out on me, even though they could rightly have done so. And I would have just thanked them anyway, you know? Mm. Wow. That, uh, that's so good to know. And Randy, thank you for the, thank you for that great question. Wendy, welcome to the conversation. She's saying, hi, Sarah. So looking forward to reading this. I have been following the story on court TV since it happened. Hi, Wendy. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. And Jay, one of the many reasons I was really excited to talk to you tonight was because I, Wendy, like you, I was also watching it, following it, you know, following it, the developing, um, unfolding story. And, um, and, 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 and so I'm so excited to, to, to chat with you. Jay, let's back up a little bit and share with everyone how you started, how and why you wanted to be a private investigator, how you started doing that work, and then separately how you became an author first writing The Kill Jar and now while, while Idaho slept. Did you always want to be both? Did one evolve and then the other? Let's let everyone into the backstory on those. You know, that's a very interesting question. Uh, it's reverse of what you suggested. I actually started writing The Kill Jar before I became a private investigator, and that's how I became one. What happened was um, this: so when, I was, when I was a kid, somebody tried to abduct me. Um, it was at, at the, in the 1970s. It was the same time that this, that this uh, alleged solo serial killer was roaming the, the area around Detroit suburbs and uh, abducting children, holding them in captivity, and then eventually killing them. Four, four kids this happened to. Around that time, somebody tried to abduct me. Um, it was I wrote about it in the kill jar, but it, 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 I got away. Nothing happened. Uh, and in fact, I didn't even tell my parents. Um, they, I was walking home from a little shopping mall by myself. Somebody tried to get me in their car. I took off. And I didn't tell them because I was uh, culpable in a crime. I... I had been shoplifting in in the local the local uh, drugstore as we called them, and this person saw me. I noticed them see me. So when they tried to get me into their car four blocks later, I thought they were security, and so I didn't tell my my family that somebody tried to get me because uh, I thought I was getting in trouble. I would have gotten in trouble because I would have had to explain that I was stealing candy. So. Um, and I didn't even know they were trying to get me. I thought they were just trying to get me back to the drugstore. We know that's not how it happens. A security guard doesn't follow a child four blocks away in his vehicle and then try to get them into the car, right? Um, but at, it wasn't until I was a, an adult raising my own kids that this occurred to me, like this event came back to me. And I became obsessed with trying to figure out if the person who tried to abduct me became what was the, the killer of these other kids, this of this unsolved case. And um, so I spent years studying the case files. Uh, um, researching online, just like everybody else at cyber sleuthing. I was in Reddit forums and um, getting a lot of information there. And then I learned how to actually get case files, actual files. And then I made contact with the family and things like that. And I spent a good decade working on this book. I, I kept, uh, uh, freelancers know this, you know, you run into the same people at coffee shops all the time when you're doing your work. And, um, and I kept running into this woman who kept asking me about you know what I was studying? I like because I'd have murder files with me, and I'm eating a scone at Big City Coffee down here in Boise, and <laughs> and um, and uh, well, it turned out that she was a private investigator working for a firm and wanted to poach me um, from my life, and that's what happened. She she after several conversations over a course of a month or two um, asked me to come work for the firm she was working for, and. Uh, they taught me how to be a private investigator. Um, and by that time, the, by that time, the, the book was almost done. So I did most of the kill jar without having had the training or what's most important, the, the access to databases um, that we get as a private investigator. When you're a PI, you can search information in a way that in a, once you're vetted, you can search in a way that, that you can't as a civilian. Um, so right now I have access to all kinds of uh, databases that, that were helpful in writing while Idaho slept. But at the time, I didn't have any of that. I learned how to, I got that access and I learned how to do what I was doing. Basically, in it, it would have taken me three years to write the kill jar instead of the 10 it took me had I had the training beforehand. But, um, and then, and then I just, so I just fell into it. I became a PI for this company for five years, uh, investigating all kinds of things, uh, robberies, whatever you name it. And then and now I work uh, mostly domestic cases, um, 
which I won't talk much about, but there are things that are not related to like corporate or theft or whatever. They're related to people. Those are the cases that I work um, now. And, 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 um, um, and the writing of the books, I've always been a writer. I, I got my MFA in poetry 20, year, 20 years ago. Um, wow. Two books, of, two books of poetry published from uh, reputable places. Uh, uh, my poetry was reviewed in places like Bomb Magazine or NPR, um, things like that. But, but that was a, lo- a, a lifetime ago. And then um, I wrote screenplays. I worked on a film about the child sex trade in America. I worked on... Um, uh, I've worked on many projects, an MMA fighter movie. Um, so, th- so writing is not new to me at all. It's 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 just that it's just that the big books that I've written have been about cases that haunted me, and it's it's just sort of shifted my focus. And I've become this true crime writer accidentally. It, it wasn't like I said. I, it, it, I I'm very. Um, I guess you could say sensitive or whatever. If I watch true crime or listen to your show religiously, or if I do what it's like. Um, it haunts me too much. So I don't actually, I don't actually live in that world in my day to day to day. I live in it in my work and in, uh, but, but I try to um, spend big parts of my entertainment day. Like if I'm watching something, uh, it's usually something like American Idol or something or, or uh, the voice on YouTube. Like it, I need to watch uplifting things. I'm not really a, I like to, I like to have a good cry over something happy. So, (laughs) Yeah, it's not expected because I come off so dark and because I've got a wall like this. Um, but, but this is just my work. This is my this is where I work. You know. Wow. Okay. Oh my gosh. This is so wow. Okay. Um, Jay is the coolest. We can all go home now. Um, oh my goodness. We have a New York Times bestselling author Heather Gudenkoff in the audience. Heather Gudenkoff has entered the chat. Hi, Heather. She says, hi, Sarah and Jay. What cold case, if any, would you be interested in investigating? Ooh. Heather, you asked the right question. <laughs> Heather does ask the right question. Uh, you can't tell right now, but I'm I'm slightly crying. I, I mentioned that um, that I like to have a good cry over things like American Idol or The Voice or something. Oh. But um, you know, there's this case. Uh, it's a current case. I wouldn't say it's a cold case because it's new. But uh, the case of Michael Vaughn, uh, Michael Monkey Vaughn, they call him in Fruitland, Idaho, a young boy who is. Uh, uh, abducted maybe gosh it might be going on two years now um fruitland is less than an hour from me uh and and it's in my backyard basically and um it's one of those things you know like certain cases get get all the eyeballs on them because the, because social media decides that's where they want their eyeballs right um social media starts it YouTubers, podcasters continue it. Mainstream media picks up on it. And it's, it's who's to say, we don't really know why one case gets all the eyeballs and another, and another doesn't. Um, but the case of Michael Vaughn, just the sweetest little boy. Um, I, I, when that happened, uh, I felt like I wanted to go there and be, I, I almost felt like I wanted to move to Fruitland and just live there until I figured it out. Um, it's an hour away. It's not a big deal at all, right? It's less than an hour. And um, that case, the only reason that case haunts me more than others is because it's right there and because I feel like I should be able to do something and I can't. I don't know what to do about it, right? Um, and and But that's just symbolic of every case, the, 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 the hundreds of thousands of children who are abducted every year. Um, we don't know and we don't know what happens to them. Uh, most of them are parental abductions. Um, and we find them, but there's still around the world, hundreds of thousands of, of kids go missing. And um, it's horrific. It's the stuff of nightmares. And um, I feel like uh, uh, there, there's some sort of like duty that I feel that, go, that goes unmet when I, when I stand still and don't do anything about cases like Michael's. What can I do? I don't know. Uh, what can I do that the police aren't doing? I don't know. There's hundreds of them working this case. Uh, and yet, as an outsider, I think that's why you, you, you feel, I feel anyway, so broken by these cases because 
I know that there's nothing, literally nothing I can do, um, except for tell the story, if that's the story I decide to tell. And like, like with this book, While Idaho Slept, um, you know, writers are a certain type of first responder. We don't show up with bandages. We don't show up with, with guns. Um, but we, we show up to tell the story. And, and I, I, I do feel like Michael's story um, would be next if there weren't already a number of people sort of trying to figure that out locally. Um, there are other writers, there are other podcasters who have covered it a little bit. Um, but it's, um, I don't know, if, this, if the case of Michael Vaughn goes on another year or so, I feel like that's something that I'll probably get involved in. Heather, thank you so much for the excellent question and for joining us tonight. So Heather's last book, um, which was fiction, Heather's a fiction writer, um, focused on a uh, focused on a true crime as well. And um, so Heather, I'm very interested to see you here. I'm very thrilled to see you here. Um, and and Jay, one thing I've noticed is that both fiction writers and true crime writers. If you know them well enough, you can see that what they are puzzling through in their writing. So, for instance, if I am reading a friend who I really know really well, I can I, I can and I'm reading her completely imaginary world of, you know, characters and whatever of not a novel. But I can say, oh, there's that that, you know, that wound that she just, you know, couldn't quite get over, you know, with her something happened, you know, 25 years ago or whatever, or something she's just really trying to still puzzle their way through. And I always feel like out of all of the cases that you could cover and all of the themes that any of us could write about, the ones that draw us actually say the most about us, because that's why do we choose them and why do they choose us? And so it's interesting to me that you're drawn to this yourself having survived being an attempted abduction, you know, and so we can sort of see how that calls you and why that is so deeply viscerally you know triggering and 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 vital to to you to do that work yeah, yeah. also the children aspect you know the university of idaho students case let's call it for a minute um you know yeah they're they're in their 20s the early 20s but just like five years ago somebody just like two years ago somebody was doing all of their laundry for them oh. and, feed, and feeding them food and um oh telling them to sit down for dinner, right? And so these are just kids that that had their first taste of adulthood. In my mind, they're just kids though. And um, because I see them at 15 or 12 or nine. In fact, I say in the book, or I say all the time, all of these people, uh, even, the perpet even the alleged perpetrator, uh, all of these people were just five years old at some point and uh, walking around in their footsie pajamas and trying to, trying to figure out, yeah, exactly. That face you made is exactly how I feel when I, when I think about these characters and, um, and, and um, I identify with that with, with that a lot. I think that I write this stuff. Um, I, I don't want to seem like a, a, a much of a, mm, I, I seem like I'm trapped in trauma when I talk about this next thing a lot, but I'm really not anymore. I was until I wrote the kill jar. The kill jar is a lot about my, my own life as well. It's a mem it's a true crime memoir. Uh, it's a memoir of my hunt through that case. And a lot of it, it talks about my childhood. And, um, you know, I saw my mother uh, compromised in, in domestic violence situations a few times. And, um, and um, you know, that never, I don't think that ever leaves somebody, you know. And um, so when I think about, you know, and I, it's like, I, I could be, on the one hand, I could be writing about abused women. That's not what I write about. I write about the children, basically. But I think it's because I am working through that trauma of mine or whatever. You know, I think there's a lot to be said about that. Um, I don't cry about it every day or something, but I do think that's probably the origin uh, of my interest in certain cases, for sure. Um, to, to be vulnerable, to, to experience violence as a kid, certainly. I think, you know, I wrote a piece for Writer's Digest re recently that, about true crime writing. And uh, and and it and in that piece, I talk about how many true crime writers and crime fiction writers, for that matter, come to it from places of trauma. That's that's why we're in those in those worlds. We feel, and that's why we feel comfortable in those worlds, right? Um, whereas people from really happy childhoods or really unscathed lives mm. don't really feel comfortable in that because they don't. It's a shock to their system. Mm. Um, and so. 
you know, like in jujitsu, they say be comfortable in uncomfortable positions. And, and that's, that's kind of what I think a lot of true crime writers are and a lot of crime writers. And we say that in yoga as well. Oh yeah. I'll bet. I'll bet. Uh, but that I, know, I do a little bit of yoga. I've got my, I've got some beads here. Um, I'm, oh, I'm really? trying to, I'm trying to be a more spiritual person. Um, I'm not an expert at it though. Uh, but I, but I do enjoy yoga. So I do understand what you're getting at. Yeah. Yeah. I teach yoga. So it's something that I've, you know, to be comfortable in uncomfortable spaces is something that I always say, you know, can we be grounded and breathe through this on the mat? And can we do that off the mat as well? Can we have the difficult conversation? Can we have the difficult moment? And can we stay present and open hearted and, 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 and allow ourselves to be in that space? And I think it would be, I'd love to see that happening more in our world. Um, We were all able to do that a little more. Leech is saying, wow, this is how awesome. She says she loves poetry. Oh, Leech, that's so lovely. I didn't know that about you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, mystery user joining us saying, my husband is a retired PI. He did mostly insurance fraud. Be careful with the domestic cases. He only took one of those cases. I, I did mostly insurance fraud when I worked for that company um, that I worked for for five years. I did robberies. I did... Uh, um, and when, when you talk about a robbery fraud case it, what, or, or burglary fraud case, it means like a store reported a break in and they had a half million dollars of products stolen, but they, re- they only have receipts for five thousand dollars of it. So you have to figure out, is that fraud? Are they lying about what was stolen? Things like that. Or slip mm-hmm. and fall. The woman is or, or the person is is explaining um, insurance fraud, like fake, fake elbow injuries or whatever that they mean. To get workers' comp for things like that, so that's that's what insurance fraud or pharmaceutical fraud. A lot of doctors are actually double billing insurance companies, things like that. Um, oh, how bizarre! Yeah, so I did a lot of that as well. In the domestic cases, I understand this person's hesitation. Um, they can be dark. It's basically one person suspicious of another person for various reasons, and they want you to investigate. You get involved in a lot of, of dirty business, for sure. Um. Thank you for that wonderful comment. Heather saying, I'm so sorry. I meant Jay. So sorry. No, Heather, we knew what you meant. Uh, you, know, you get typing in these computers or phone just autocorrect and the rest is history. I don't even know what it said. What did it say? She accidentally called you Randy. <laughs> but oh. I knew she meant Jay, so I read it as that. Um, Heather, we're, I'm with a vibe. We're vibing, Heather. I totally know what you mean. She said, this is such a, what a tragic story. I'm hoping this case is solved. Ugh, oh, me too. Um, thank you for that. George, welcome to the conversation. Joining us from Texas saying, hi, Sarah and Jay. Late to the party. Do you think an overspending of media attention in one form or another hinders more investigations or helps more investigations? George, with the good questions, always. That's that's a great question. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by overspending, but I will say that it's probably related to just simply media attention in one form or another. And um, I, I, I do think... think- I think what he meant about what you said, like some cases get more eyeballs. I yes. think is what he means. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I th- it's got to be what 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 George means. Um, and and maybe spending meaning, uh, oh, attention is spent, media attention spent. That's that that reading of the word spent as well. Anyway, the point is, uh, yeah, uh, both. Um, he I wrote he clarified. He said, "Do you think an overabundance of media attention in all of its forms hinders?" More investigations rather than helps. George, thank you for that clarification. Yes, absolutely both. Um, I'll tell you why. <laughs> um, um, it, uh, it doesn't hinder more than help. It does. It help, hinders and helps is what I mean to say. Um, and I wrote about that extensively in the book. The, a huge threat in the book is the social media attention driving the mainstream media attention and then driving investigators in certain ways, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, when this case, when this case blew up, it first blew up on social media, um, and I include then YouTube, podcasts, things like that. Even though it's not technically social media platforms, it is where our, where our media lies in the social, how we socialize. Basically, did you see that YouTube video? We send the YouTube video and whatever. We're not usually sending Fox News links or CNN links. This is more grassroots. You might have more followers than I mean, somebody might have more followers on YouTube than than all of all of Fox News anyway. I mean, there's there's a lot of that. Um, but the point being, that drove the the eyeballs. Mainstream media then followed suit. Um, uh, newscasters parachuted in, as I say, um, 
and, and from all, all over the country, mostly the East and West coasts. And because of the hundreds of people on scene in, in Moscow with their cameras, in the book I say slung over their shoulders, their tripods slung over their shoulders like pickaxes in a gold rush, um, the, you know, the, 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 they needed content to report back. They needed to justify having been sent there. So what news reporters do is they pound on the police department, the local police department for, department for answers. They create a frenzy when the police department doesn't give answers that what they report is the police won't talk. Um, or what they do is they say like blundering police detectives won't say a word, right? So the police then have to come out in front of it. They hold press conferences. They do what they can do. They say what they can say that they're legally allowed to say or what they can say that doesn't, even if they're legally allowed to say it, maybe they don't want to because it's going to hinder the investigation. So they walk this really fine line. That happened here with Chief Fry, the Moscow Police Department, finding himself in the international spotlight. Um, and and uh, in, in the very first days, sort of my, struggling a little bit with it. But it, it, it's clear that they developed a strategy and they then ran the media, basically. How, but at first, it was very, it was very difficult. I mean, the guy was trying to solve the biggest case Idaho had seen, uh, North Idaho especially, in decades and decades and decades, if, if not ever. And, and he had people with long lenses shooting photos of him through his workspace at the police department. And this is a guy who, who lives in a place that's got 25,000 people normally, nine months of the year. During the summers, there's half of that uh, because the school is out. So this is a guy not used to having hairdos, as I call them, show up in, and and um, walk around him with microphones. Um, so it made it difficult. But at the same time, at the same time, all the eyeballs on this case meant that that valuable work was crowdsourced by the cyber sleuthing community, um, uh, usually taxing expensive work. I mean, they were getting... Um, video footage uh, sent to them of, you know, from security cameras or whatever. They were getting, uh, cyber sleuths were checking Venmo accounts for them, public Venmo accounts. They were, they were checking like public running apps and things like that. They were, the sleuths were investigating the sort of environs for the police. And in some ways that was good. They, they sometimes provided valuable information. On the other hand, again, the police then had to wade through 10,000 tips instead of 500 and that takes valuable resources that the police didn't have. So the FBI is forced to do that. In some ways, it's it's great to have, let's say, 500,000 people looking at your case trying to solve it for you. But of course, inevitably, um, lots of those people don't have investigative prowess. Um, they they watch crime TV shows and they think they know how to solve a case. Necessarily, that's not necessarily true. And and they name people as suspects who then get uh, harassed online and dogpiled on online. They, they call people things like, oh, creepy or disgusting to look at or whatever. And these are just neighbors of the victims. Like one guy, they said, oh, he certainly did it. Look at that creep talk. Now this guy, every time you Google his name, is going to come up as the creep that lived next door. And so that's a real problem. We can't have that. There needs to be like a, a stronger code of ethics or a ruling body of some sort. If there's going to be a million and a half cyber sleuths trying to crack cases every time a big case pops off, there should be some like governing body in the cyber sleuthing community or something. The way the way hackers sort of dick, you know, that they'll they'll hack somebody they don't like for doing bad business or whatever, you know, like there should be some kind of situation that in an ideal world that would exist. Exist. I know that that can exist, but the point is, a lot of havoc was wreaked in in this case. A lot of good was done as well, and that's. I think we're going to see that in every major case now going forward because the cyber community, sleuthing community, um, built this thing into a into a into a monster, and and you can do that in a heartbeat with the next case. And there's, it's just um, they saw also the monetization of it drove this. When you have podcasters or TikTokers even, you know, TikTokers showed up and did dances in front of the murder house. Um, when you have stuff like that going just for clicks and views and whatever, and the monetization that comes along with that, um, I mean, it's just like I think it started with the Johnny Depp Amber Heard case. And that's the last thing I'll say. Um, there were individual YouTubers covering that case. They're basically reaction reels every single day. And they were 
all of a sudden they're getting, you know, 50,000 or 100,000 followers of their channel or subscribers of their channel. I mean, that's a lot to just cover a Johnny Depp case, right? So if you can build that kind of audience off of just following the next murder case, that's not going to stop. It's just going to get bigger and people are going to monetize and monetize and people have to eat. And it's and in some ways, if they're ethical, that's not a big deal. It's, a, it's an ethical reporting of circumstances, no different than Fox or CNN or NBC, as long as they're ethical in how they do it. But, but we're going to see a lot of the unethical stuff blow up too. Mm. Wow. Thought-provoking conversation here. Y'all, I want to remind you that the book is out. It dropped last Tuesday. It's been out for six days and you can grab your copy tonight from our favorite woman-owned independent bookstore. That is, of course, Murder by the Book. So whether you're watching with us on Facebook or YouTube, here is that link. So click and order so that you too can get your mitts on while Idaho slept. Um, and I and I want to say, you know, Booklist calls this book an extremely rigorous book. Appleman uses firsthand sources whenever possible. And while he rightly gives credit where credit is due, he also doesn't shy away from revealing the investigation's weaknesses. High praise there from Booklist. And they are not the only ones raving publishers weekly, deeming your attention to detail, quote, fastidious. Um, and saying, uh, they're saying it is admirable but really really sets this apart is, is is your examination of the tension between the moscow police and the self-appointed investigators which we are just talking about right now so um i want to uh we are actually over time but we are having so much so much fun time flies when you're having it george when you're having a good time george says wow what a great answer thank you we just saying congratulations on the release thank you so much for joining us jay Appleman, thank you for joining us live from Idaho to give us the inside scoop on While Idaho Slept. And again, you guys, so much to talk about here from this unique voice, unique perspective of a um, private investigator and author. So here again is that link, whether you are watching on Facebook or YouTube, you're going to want to get your hands on this book and two-time published poet, which is why we can get sentences like um, the camera slung over their shoulders, like... Um, uh, 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 oh my gosh, I just lost it. My brain is, my brain is Pickaxes in the gold rush. Pickaxes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> just, so here again is that link, you guys, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. I loved that analogy. And as only a poet could say it. Um, George saying, sorry, I called you Randy. I was trying to multitask. I saw Heather suit Randy and then followed suit. Heather, it's all your That's fault. Okay. It's um, Randy. Uh, I only knew one Randy and I worked with him. I liked him. Uh, when I was 14, 15 years old, I can remember him. Randy, Randy B. I'll call him. He was a cool guy, um, so I don't mind being called Randy. Your new, your that's your undercover name is now Randy. Randy. Lisa, thank, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this live chat. Thank Wendy, you, okay, I catch a clue saying thank you both. Thank you all. Um, <laughs> Heather's saying she's so sorry. Heather, you're amazing. Hi. Heather is a fabulous Good. New York Times. I'll have to, I'll have to read Heather's. I will have to read Heather's books now. I'll go look. Yes. Yes, you will. And follow her. She posts beautiful pictures. Sure, um, sure. George saying thank you so much. Y'all, it has been a pleasure. Jay, Ruben, Appleman, thank you so much. And I will see you um, I will see you all next Monday. Have a killer week until then.